Well, welcome to worship for November 22nd, 2020. And with Thanksgiving week coming up and Thanksgiving day coming up, I know this COVID stuff is getting a lot of people discouraged and you might be tempted to be discouraged. I know I am. That's why, again, I put this together. I want to be able to focus in on the goodness of God. I want to be able to remember that we put our hope in God alone. And my message for this service is on the concept and the idea of gratitude. So may God bless you as he fills your spirit with his hope and with his love and encouragement. Everyone loves a good story. How many times has a movie, a book, or a song made you feel something deep and moving? Something you couldn't even describe. The stories we connect with most are the ones where we see glimpses of our own story. They show us more of who we are and who we could become. The Bible is that kind of a story, full of mystery, action, miracles, conflict, drama, and love. It stretches from the beginning of time, across our lives, calling us to join God to bring hope and healing to a hurting world.
out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins.
Well, um, we're going to start with a little experiment this morning. Maybe you noticed if you're a regular part of our faith community that we didn't do our usual greeting at the beginning of the service. And it's because I had a plan and here's what I'm going to do. We're going to do our greeting now in a second here, but this is what I want you to do. So everyone on my left, this side here, right down the middle of the aisle and all the way over, this is what you're going to do. You're going to greet somebody with a complaint, all right, with a complaint. The Bible calls this grumbling, so I want to give you some help. You can complain about anything in your life, your health, your money, your job problems, the fact that you have a spouse, whatever you want to complain about, all right? It's completely and totally up to you. But you're going to talk to the person, greet them with your name, and then you're going to give them a complaint. Now, everybody on my right side, you're going to greet each other with a word of gratitude or thanks, okay? So, um, right now, I want you to think about something here on the right that you're grateful for, okay? It might be something around here, beauty, something you saw you know, yesterday or today, or a friend, or the opportunity to worship God, whatever the case might be. So you're gonna say hi, and then you're gonna express a word of gratitude, where you're gonna say hi, and then you're gonna complain about something, okay? So you're ready? One, two, three, go, all right? <laughs> John? Now I want you to know, take a seat please. All right, everyone. All right, everybody. Take a seat please. All right, here we go, stop now. <laughs> this might get completely out of control. So, <laughs> oh, this is great. Now we're gonna see how the experiment went, okay? For those of you on the left, as a result of our greeting time, how many of you feel more happy, more vibrant, more alive, and closer to God because you did some grumbling than you did even when you walked in the door? Okay, raise your hand. How much of you, how many of you are happy that you had a chance to grumble? <laughs> okay, you have the spiritual gift of complaint. All right? Now, those of you on the right side, how many of you feel more happy, more alive, more vibrant, and closer to God because of all the gratitude that you heard? Raise your hand. Now, how many of you on the left want to complain about all those people? <laughs> One of the things that uh, people ask me about, not necessarily frequently, but enough to make a difference, is what we do at this faith community, our congregation, our church here at Our Savior. And, what our mission is all about, kind of our purpose and stuff. And I try to break it down into three words, basically what, why, and how. A lot of churches have mission statements, and ours is not necessarily that original per se, but it's the type of thing that sticks with me. We want to love God, love others, and live like Jesus, and live as disciples. And you see, I'm really passionate about discipleship, not necessarily about perpetuating some sort of institution or religion or Christianity in terms of what we would know as something that is staid and emotionless and basically have it, but rather something where people like you and me are following Jesus. And we want to be able to build a safe place and a loving place here at our Savior. We can journey together and discover Jesus and a life of faith, but also where we can grow together as disciples or followers of Jesus. That's why I take so seriously what it means to be a disciple that I choose not to use the word Christian, which in some circles is misunderstood these days, but actually to define what a Christian is by saying that a Christian is a disciple, a Jesus follower. Now, there are a number of great things that we could talk about when it comes to talking about a disciple's life, but I want to share with you today what might be regarded by some, especially in my case, myself, is a baseline attitude or mindset of a disciple 
And that is gratitude. It's gratitude. Now, as you might guess, the Bible is full of passages. The Bible is full of this big theme of gratitude. You can see it, especially in a couple of these verses. This is by the Apostle Paul writing to a specific faith community in Asia Minor. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in how many circumstances? Always. All right. For this is God's will for you in Christ. Make music from your heart to the Lord, giving thanks how often? Always, always to God the Father in everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we're going to be talking today discipleship training in many respects. You might want to say discipleship training 101 on the discipline of gratitude. Now, if you walked in, again, another surprise for some of you who might be uh, regulars with us in our faith community, on the front part of your bulletin insert, which is usually chock full of information, is blank today. And that's for a specific reason. So what I want you to do is I want you to take that insert out right now. If you have a pencil or a pen nearby you, somebody came with you that might have one, grab something you can write with if you have an opportunity to do so. Now, it's all part of the plan today. What we're going to do is try something out during the message. Because sometimes, I have to admit this, sometimes I bet that during any of my sermons, your mind might drift a bit, right? I mean, let's be honest here, all right? It is church time. Well, today my plan is to encourage you to let your mind drift toward gratitude. So on that sheet of paper, throughout the message, yes, you heard me right, throughout the message, during the message, write down some things that you're grateful for. And then since I tell you all the time at the end of the service to take home the insert as a reminder of all the activities and things that we're planning here in our faith community that I don't want you to forget, you can look at that sheet of paper regularly and it can refresh this attitude of gratitude. So. Here's some things in case you need to be reminded to be grateful for. Just a few categories. Maybe you're grateful for some individuals that God has brought into your life. Maybe a family member or a friend or a co-worker. Maybe you've had an experience lately that has just been immensely outstanding and blessed you immensely. Maybe a hike or a trip on the lake or something like that. Maybe you went through a time where you were really struggling and you really felt God comforting you and you want to say thank you and you want to be grateful for that. Whatever the case might be, what I want you to do throughout the message is monitor your mind and monitor your heart. I believe God will nudge you with something you're grateful for. And when he does, like I said, keep that pen or that pencil handy and write that out on the front part of the insert. And by the end of the message time, you'll have a bunch of awesome and wonderful words to look at. And we will not end this message time without talking to God and thanking God for every single one of those blessings, okay? So the big idea for the day, there's your bulletin insert, it should look exactly like that. The idea is what are we grateful for and what is gratitude all about? Well, here's a definition for you. More gratitude will not come from more acquisitions, but from more awareness of God's presence and God's goodness. Now, friends, it'd be too easy to talk with you about just the therapeutic benefits of gratitude because there are lots of them, and you probably know that already. What I'd like us to consider is something together different. I want us to be able to focus specifically on a Christ-following, Christ-Jesus-inspired, Jesus-shaped gratitude because, generally speaking, that is a lens through which we look at all of life, all of life, for a disciple is meant to be looked through the lens, or if you will, the heart of gratitude. Now there's this writer by the name of Robert Roberts. Now I was thinking when I read the book, I'm going, what were his parents thinking? Come on, Robert Roberts. But anyway, he wrote this book on gratitude and uh, he kind of gives us a helpful framework from which to be able to look at what it means for us to be gracious in gratitude as a Christ follower. He defines gratitude this way. He says, gratitude is always the perception of the good. Gratitude is a byproduct. It's a way of seeing things or having the certain type of sight or vision of life that is God glorifying. He says, when he's trying to clarify this a little bit, that he says gratitude really boils down to three factors. 
Now, the language here is a little bit different because he uses a Latin word, a Latin word, bene, which means good. And he talks about three different benes in terms of understanding deeper about what it means to be a person and a heart full of gratitude. First of all, he says benefit. The mindset of gratitude is something that looks for benefit. In order for you and me, in other words, to be grateful, we have to be receiving a gift. And here's the important thing to remember with the benefit. We must perceive that this gift is a good thing for us to receive. In other words, we have to believe that this gift is not only favorable, but beneficial to us. Now, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 103, he said, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, right? All his benefits. You see, if I were you, I'd be writing this down right now. I'd be taking notes about this. Because God does all sorts of things. He gives us benefits. And the psalmist says, don't forget the benefits. We're not supposed to do that. Remember the benefits that God brings us. We all have to know, friends, that our lives are filled with the benefits of God. You see, the reason I think he says this is because we are blind to God's benefits most of the time because our attention is grabbed and directed elsewhere. But gratitude demands, if you will, or requires that we see those benefits and that we know that those benefits are good. A second factor in a mindset of gratitude is to be able to understand that there's not only a benefit, but there has to be a benefactor. And a benefactor is defined as this, someone who does good. So for you and me to be grateful means that we must believe not just that benefits are coming our way, but that they're not coming our way randomly or by accident, but they're coming to us with a purpose and that they're coming to us from somebody. And we must believe that this benefactor has good intentions toward us. And now, as you may guess, the writers of the Bible here too, because they're absolutely convinced that God is the great benefactor, they talk about being filled with this type of reality in their lives as well. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. This is from the book of James. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Now, if you're reading or studying the Bible and you run across the word light or lights, it's always an expression of God's goodness. Think back, what was the first thing that God created in Genesis chapter 1? It was light, right? And we looked at the light, he said it was good. So friends, there is a good God. He's a benefactor. He's giving to you and to me gifts all the time. And gratitude grows when we know the benefactor personally. But then there's a third element that has to be in play when we're growing in gratitude. There has to be a benefit. There has to be a benefactor. And there's got to be, to be having a heart full of gratitude, there has to be a beneficiary, someone who receives the good. And who is that? That's you and me. You see, you and I are beneficiaries of the benefits of God, and God always has our best interests at heart. And this is going on, friends, all the time. Now, again, as the beneficiary of God's goodness, you and me have to believe this God has a good heart toward us, and here's what's crucial to know about being a beneficiary. For there to be gratitude, in order for us to be grateful, we must believe that we are receiving something that we did not earn, that we did not merit, and that we did not deserve. For you see, gratitude always involves humility. It always comes from a foundation or posture of personal humility. Because if I believe or you believe that we are owed something, we will not be thankful for it because we'll be feeling that we are entitled to it. And entitlement kills gratitude all the time, day after day, moment by moment, in every person's heart that feels entitled. Feeling entitled wipes out gratitude. For example, say that somebody came up to my dear wife today and said, Vicki, I want to give you a car today. Now, I was going to say a boat, but that's a bad subject in our, in our relationship. <laughs> I want to give you a car today. Now, they hand her the keys. She says, 
immensely grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is awesome. I can't believe your goodness toward me. But if Vicky had actually paid for the car, wrote a check for it, and the person who sold it to her gave her the keys, she might say, well, fine, that's okay. You know, thank you for maybe giving me a good price break. I'm overwhelmed, but I bought it. I'm owed it because my payment entitles me to that car. So let me tell you, the default mode, the default mode of a broken human race is not gratitude. The default mode of a broken human race is entitlement. The belief that any gift or that any experience is rightfully ours and that we are owed. And here's the deal. The more we think that we're entitled to, the less grateful we will be. In other words, the bigger the sense of entitlement, the smaller the sense of gratitude. In other words, my little self-focused, obsessed mind can convince me that anything in this world that I'm entitled to, and if I am not getting what I want, somebody in the universe must be messing up because they owe me and they ought to pay for it. And because of that mindset, friends, that has led to a proliferation of lawsuits because we don't get something we really want and we're apt to sue somebody. <laughs> A friend of mine lives in Northern California. He went to a San Francisco Giants baseball game on Father's Day a few years ago. And he told me that there were a bunch of people who were suing the Giants baseball team because when they passed out Father's Day gifts, they only gave them to men. True story. Another true story, a woman who claimed to be a psychic was awarded a million dollars by a court when her doctor told her to get a CAT scan. And when the CAT scan was finished, apparently, her psychic abilities went away. She received a million dollars. True story. Friends, you see, this is why in a God-honoring framework, ingratitude, ingratitude is not just a psychological problem. It's not just an impoverishment of the soul or an emotional experience, ingratitude is actually what the Bible would call a sin. It's the actual demonstration of something broken within us. The Apostle Paul in the Bible, in the New Testament says that ingratitude is the hallmark of a life. It's proof positive of a life that's opposed to God. So Paul says when he's talking to people about living a life as a follower of Jesus, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. You see, this is what he's talking about. The connection is so interesting. Their thinking is futile. They thought, they perceived themselves to be entitled, that they were owed. They weren't gracious, grateful receivers of grace every moment. Now let's make a quick shift here because the Bible has a specific word for ingratitude and it's the word grumble, <laughs> grumble. And Paul says in the New Testament that grumbling is the quintessential mindset of a non-disciple's life. Here's what's kind of odd though when it comes to ingratitude. Have you ever heard of a church person grumbling? You ever heard of that kind of thing happening in local congregations? You see, I have this theory, and I've had it for years, that people can be lured away from God in many different ways, but in my experience, it happens quicker with grumbling about things than anything else. So let me show you how seriously God takes this. Again, this is from the New Testament. Apparently, the Apostle Paul heard of some complaining and grumbling going on in this faith community in Corinth. And he wrote to them and he told them some things. He was telling them some things about what happened in the Old Testament, the story about the people of God being delivered from slavery, brought to the Mount of Sinai, where they were going to receive a covenant from God. But the entire way that God was leading them, the people were grumbling. They weren't grateful. And so Paul says, do not grumble as some of them did. That's the context. And were killed by a destroying angel. By the way, look again, you people on the left. <laughs> How many of you are a little worried right now? <laughs> Just joking. So as we kind of make a home stretch turn here, 
Let's look to Jesus because Jesus knew how to live a life filled with gratitude. You see, in his context, in his context as a devout Jewish person, a Jewish person at Jesus' time was devoted to two particular daily forms of prayer. The first one was called the Shema, where basically it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Why? Because he is our great benefactor. In other words, the writer of Deuteronomy, Moses himself says, love God because God blesses us in so many ways. People in Jesus' time would pray that prayer. The other form of prayer that they would pray would be sometimes called the 18, or its fuller title, and here's that little bene again, would be 18 benedictions. Again, benedictions. Bene meaning good, dictions being words or speech. In Hebrew, a benediction was any prayer that began with the word or concept of being blessed or blessing. To bless is to speak good to somebody else. So, in Jesus' context, this was the people of God's, the Jewish nations, the Jewish people's daily habit and spiritual discipline. They were instructed to speak good, to bless, to thank God, and they would do it all the time, every single day. In the morning, they would wake up and they would pray the 18, blessed are you, O God. When they went to bed, they would pray the 18, blessed are you, O God. In the middle of the day, they would pause and they would pray the 18, blessed are you, Lord God. When they were sick, they would pray the 18, Blessed are you, Lord God, who heals the sick. When they were near death experiences with members of their family or friends, they would pray the 18. Blessed are you, Lord God, who sustains the living and raises the dead. They would thank God for that type of goodness that they have experienced in the hope that they would anticipate and hold on to for dear life. You see, in Jesus' context, it was an integral part of every Jewish person's life to be trained in gratitude, to be discipled in gratitude. And you see, gratitude just doesn't come with more stuff. Gratitude doesn't come with more stuff. That's the absolute insane belief in our day. Gratitude comes when you see reality, all the benefits from a wonderful and loving benefactor of which you and me are the grace-given beneficiaries. Now, I wish I had a time to kind of give you the full scope of all these, quote-unquote, 18 benedictions. Because the people would pray them, they would pray the 18 for extra time on the Sabbath to be able to worship God and set aside time in time of rest to be able to honor God in their lives. They would say the 18 over every meal because every meal was an occasion for gratitude. Food was not to be eaten till people stopped and remembered that it was a gift. They just didn't inhale the food the way that we do. A rabbi once said, a man must not taste anything until he blessed it. And so blessing God was an important part of every single meal. Whenever we bless the food, we bless the God who gave it. As the psalmist also wrote, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. You see, life, friends, is all a gift. Another ancient rabbi once wrote, he said, he who enjoys anything from creation which is without blessing commits misuse. Basically, he means no gratitude is a form of theft. And because of that, Again, in Jesus' context, people were discipled to see no occasion as too menial from benediction and blessing. The general rule of thumb in discipleship in Jesus' day was to look throughout the day and keep their hearts and eyes focused on gratitude because you never knew when you would perceive another blessing. And you did not want to miss that moment and you did not want to miss the opportunity to thank God for what came into your life. In some of the stuff that I read about, about Jesus' context, there was even a lesson to be learned about being grateful for imperfect people and imperfect circumstances. Because you see, this should be pretty logical of a connection for you. If you wait to be grateful for only perfect people and only perfect circumstances, how long are you going to have to wait? <laughs> Long time, right? 
Well, as you might have guessed, the rabbis talked about that too. A rabbi said one is obligated to say a benediction over evil as well as a benediction over good. Now, why do that? I mean, doesn't that sound counterintuitive? Are they trying to tell us, these ancient rabbis, that we should be grateful because evil is a good thing or suffering is a good thing? Well, of course not. Those are bad things, and God is at work to one day overcome and overturn them. Another rabbi who just so happened to have some of his words recorded in the New Testament, he said basically that we're obligated to set a benediction at all times because we are in the danger of being thankful only when good things come our way. Because being transformed by God means learning to see good ways in which God is at work, even in bad situations. That rabbi's name was Paul. He wrote these words, for I know that in all things, God is at work for good. And that rabbi, the same one said, we bless God all the time, give you thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. One more thing, and this is really important. Every single one of us who follow Jesus, we owe our ultimate gratitude for God's ultimate gift in Christ, don't we? Above all followers of Jesus, we recognize that in plenty or in need, whether we live in palaces or in prison, we thank God for his gift of Jesus, Jesus' matchless life, his unrivaled teachings, his sacrificial death, his triumphant resurrection. And that's why our hearts are filled with the words, blessed are you, O Lord. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. I exalt you. I give thanks to you with a grateful heart. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So I thought about this. I thought about how we can end this and try to give all of us a little bit of an action step. It's one thing to give you a pep talk, so to speak, or to be able to give you a little bit of discipleship teaching about gratitude. How do you put it into reality? Well, one of the ways, sounds simple, but it takes time and energy to do so, is to be able to, it used to take a little bit more energy to go to a store, buy a card, get a stamp, you know, write a note to somebody. But now you can pick up a phone and you can text somebody, you can email somebody, you can write a card if you'd like to, make a phone call. But if your day today is filled, let me just tell you, if your day today is filled with you touching four to five of your friends or family members with a word of gratitude, it will change their life and it will change your life as well. I experienced it this week. I was writing this message and I thought, you know, I'm just thinking about a number of people right now. So I text them a little word of gratitude and gratefulness of how they've touched my life. Every single one of them responded. You know, some of them with little tears, you know, and some of them with applause and some of them said, it's about time you recognize me, you know, <laughs> whatever the case might be. I've got some strange friends and I'm not going to mention names, but the point is, is that it was really a blessing to be blessing others. Do you recognize how infrequently we just get thanked for being ourselves? Another way is to be able to pray your own benedictions. Now, you don't want to start with 18. That might be a little bit overwhelming, but you can do this. Every single night you go to sleep, think about, if you even want to, write down four blessings that you're grateful to God for. So you can go to sleep, not with complaining or grumbling or fear, but you can go to sleep with gratitude. You can say, Lord, blessed are you. You might want to use that form. Blessed are you, Lord, for this friend you gave me or maybe this new opportunity I have in my life. Whatever the case might be, pick up the 18. Now, I'll give you a little bit of advice about this. Your job in this experiment cannot be based at this stage of the game on your feelings because sometimes you just do not feel grateful, do you? I say that for a reason. Many of you uh, who are around here and are part of our lives every single day know that Vicki and I are having our housework done. And 14 of the last 15 days, our lives have been filled with sheetrock and scaffolding and painting and repairs inside and out. And I've told many people that I can tolerate, in fact, I thrive on chaos except within my own home. 
And well, it was a week ago or so, and I can't even remember the exact day, but I got up in the morning and I was just a grumpy person. Thank goodness Vicki was asleep. And I know it's hard for many of you to think that I'm a grumpy person occasionally, but talk to Vicki, she will tell you. I woke up in the morning and I just felt grumpy. That ever happened to you? Probably has. You know what they say about the world though, there are two kinds of people, people who love to wake up in the morning and people who hate the people who love to wake up in the morning. <laughs> it was one of those mornings I was struggling with grumpiness and being positive, so I drove down to the lake, as I'm apt to do, and I had my Diet Coke, a bigger one this time. I was breaking the rules. And I was thinking about the previous day, and I was thinking, you know, yesterday, I was kind of saying this out loud in prayer. I said, yesterday, God, I had a chance to exercise. Thank you. I love the fact that I have a body that can do all sorts of things. What a gift. And yesterday, God, I had a new book that I got from Amazon with that big smiley face. And I got a chance to learn some new things. Thank you that you gave me a mind and heart that's just eager for learning. And then I looked out on the lake, and it, the sun was just coming up, one of those beautiful, amazing days. And I said, thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. A lot of people don't have that blessing. And they would give anything, anything, to have a moment by a lake on a morning that I take for granted. I said a number of other things in prayer, and then I started my truck book again, and I uh, drove to the office. But the day kept kind of going on like that, and my attitude was adjusted, and I started thinking about and seeing all sorts of blessings. And by the time I got to the end of the day, I went to sleep, and I thought to myself as I was going to sleep, I can't wake to wake up tomorrow. Because if today was filled with the blessings that I just was so thankful for, tomorrow's going to be another day to see how God brings his benefits and love into reality in my life. And I just said, thank you, God. Blessed are you, O Lord. You see, what an unbelievably great God and good God gives us an opportunity to think about our lives, our world, our bodies, our minds, our friends, our family, and Jesus, obviously, above all. And when you start dwelling on those things, pretty soon you will be overwhelmed with gratitude. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but remember, it's not about feeling gratitude. My job and your job is just to show up and remember and see and thank. So a couple of ways for you to be able to apply gratitude in your life today, okay? What I want to do now, let's close in prayer. I want you just to bow your head and I want you to look at that list. If you've been writing a list, I want you to look at every single one of those blessings and benefits. And I want you to thank God right now who's the great benefactor in your life. This God loves you so much and has given you so many blessings that your heart is just and should be filled with joy should be filled with an expression of praise. And even if you don't feel that way this morning, this is your moment in the quiet of your heart to just to say thank you to God. Would you do that right now? Would you just say in the quiet of your heart, thank you, God. Blessed are you, O Lord. In fact, let's all say it together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Blessed are you, O Lord. Lord, stir up within us, by your spirit, a heart and a life that's filled with gratitude. And we come up against this struggle that we all have within gratitude and grumbling, Lord. But we know as we grow as your disciples that, Lord, you're discipling us, you're training us in what it means to live a Jesus-honoring life. And so may his habits be our habits. And may we always be looking for your goodness every single moment of our lives and thanking you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's pray together. Why don't you bow your heads and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, here's a couple of announcements for you. Beginning this coming Wednesday, the first Wednesday after Thanksgiving, and for three Wednesdays, I'm going to be doing live streaming Advent worship experiences from most likely my living room. We'll sing a couple of songs. We'll read some scriptures of hope and anticipation for the coming of Christmas. Join us, YouTube Live, Facebook, whether it's on Our Savior's page or my personal page, and we can do some Advent worship together. We'd love to be able to have you do that. I'm going to continue doing these pre-recorded services for the rest of the calendar year. Stick with us or see our live streaming services on Sunday at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. So God bless you as you continue to grow in Him, and may this week be a filled week, a filled week, a full week of a heart in you that is full of thanksgiving and praise to God.